Good morning, Rehoboth. Welcome to worship. Let's stand and join our hearts together and fill this place with praises this morning to the Lord.
Good morning, church family. It's so wonderful to see all of you, and we want to extend a welcome to those who may or may not be worshiping with us online. We're having some technical difficulties, but hopefully those will get corrected, and you can watch this later. Um, please join me in prayer. Dear majestic God, creator of heaven and earth and all that is in it, we give thanks for our many blessings. We rejoice in your steadfast love and your faithfulness to all the generations. As we confront our humanity and mortality during the season of Lent, our sins are many and readily apparent. Too often we let the distractions, burdens, and temptations of the world drag us down. We let fear paralyze us and limit what you can accomplish. We humbly confess our transgressions and pray that with the help of your Holy Spirit, we can answer your calling with the confidence that you will provide us with all we need to accomplish your plans. Help us to bravely step forward in faith to be the disciples you have called us to be. As Jesus' brother James urges us, help us to be quick to listen, slow to speak, slow to anger, and to give grace always. Let us make allowances for others' shortcomings because we have so many failings of our own. Where there is division, let us be a bridge. In Jesus' precious name we pray, amen. amen. Now if the children want to come forward for children's time with Ms. Drenna. I never had to think about how many folks would be coming up because it was like only a handful. You guys are two fistfuls, yay. Um, and you're way far away from me. I'll just give you a hint. You may want to come closer. I would move up if I were you. I think you were the first one to move, weren't you? Awesome, thank you. Yes, sir? You read? Okay. If you guys want to slide down this way, I promise I'm, I'm retired. I'm not a teacher or a principal anymore. Well, good morning, first of all. Thank you. That makes me feel better. And I'm going to slide up closer to you. Good morning. Good morning. Awesome. Thank you. You know, um, when Pastor Mike lets me heap pick somebody to talk on the Sundays, you have to sign up. But I'm always, I think ahead, like, what do I want to talk about? What do I want the kids to know? What do I, and all of a sudden I realized there was something wrong with the way I even started. What, and when I was thinking, what do I want to tell you? Can anybody think of a better way to think about this morning instead of what do I want you to know? Who's today about? Is it about me? Not really. What do you think? Yes, sir. It is about Easter's coming up. What were you going to say? That's okay. <laughs> well, what I realized was it's not so much about what I wanted you to know, because once I got started to thinking, well, yes, sir? Can I say something? No? Okay. Once I got to thinking, I realized it wasn't about what I wanted you to know. It was what did God want me to tell you about? What did he want us to talk about this morning? And suddenly it made it a whole lot easier for me to think about what I wanted to talk about. Because hopefully God's with us this morning and he's directing what's happening. And by the way, your dress is pretty awesome. Just want you to know that. Um, can somebody help me with what is a proverb? Anybody know? What is a proverb? Proverb. Can I just tell you that I didn't really know? And I had to look at, I talked to my friend um, Alexa, a good friend of mine. I ask her questions all the time. So I, I truly didn't realize, I said, what is a proverb? Um, and I'll bet you that the audience probably, I asked my friend on the way to church, so what's a proverb? She said, well, you know, it's, and you realize it's hard to tell, it is hard to define. Well, it's actually a short saying that conveys information. And sometimes it's, um, 
it's called, well, I'm not going to go there, but it basically it's giving you information and it's typically passed down from generation to generation. So does anybody know of a proverb that they've heard about? I'll even let the audience answer. They're still sleeping. If it's not broken, don't fix it. That's a proverb. Basically means, well, you know what it means, anybody? It kind of means if things are okay, just let them be okay. You don't necessarily have to make it different just because you might think it needs to be. Well, another proverb is, and this is a friend of mine gave it to me this morning because I couldn't think of any. A stitch in time saves nine. That basically means if you fix something that's broken early, it won't turn into a big mess that you have to fix later. And the early bird catches the worm. Anybody have any ideas on that one? The early bird catches the worm. If you get up early in the morning, sometimes you'll see the robins out there now. They're in the yard digging for worms. But the early bird, it means if you get up early and work hard, you're going to get that. If you, come for, if you come for breakfast at 2 in the afternoon, chances are there's no breakfast left. Well, Pastor Mike has been talking in the past couple of weeks about birds in the, um, in the Bible. Yeah, one unfortunate bird was called the Ravens. They're also a football team, but we won't talk about them because the Kansas City Chiefs won, and that's really important. But that aside, he's been talking about birds, so I thought it might be kind of interesting to talk about birds too. So my proverb, and actually, again, it's a saying that tells you information, and it's in a way that you might remember it versus I told you to pick your toys up, which your mother's probably said a thousand times, and you just kind of, okay, I hear you. But a proverb makes you kind of think a little bit, and I have to tell you that I don't think folks think nearly as much as we should. But once you get started, then you can't get stopped. So if I was thinking about birds of a feather flocking together, first of all, you have to know what a flock is. Anybody know what a flock is? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. It's a group of birds flying together. A group is a flock, and we are talking about birds. Yay, thank you, sir. Awesome answer. It's amazing how much you guys answer questions. I love it. So we have a flock, and, and when you look up in the morning, when you look at a flock, what do you notice about? Like, I, okay. They make shapes when they go flying. Actually, they make shapes when they go flying. That's because they're aerodynamic, and they're trying to be efficient. Animals. Angles. Animals. Animals can be in flocks, groups. But what you also notice is typically if you look up and see a group of geese west, I think they actually go south closer to the equator, but it, they may go via the west. That could be correct as well. But what you notice is that when the geese fly, and we notice those because they're so noisy, you can be out in your yard and you'll hear the geese flying overhead. Do you see the robins and the geese flying together? Interestingly enough, they, they tend to, yes, sir? They only fly in their group. I hope uh, Pastor Mike gave me lots of time because it looks like we might need it. Awesome. Great answer. Somebody else over there. Was it you that answered? Awesome. Thank you. Great catch as well. And you answered too. And I have more where they came from, so don't worry, guys. But basically what it talks about is the fact that a flock is a group and that group stays together. What kind of a flock would you call us? If you were going to name us, what flock do we belong to? Uh, hang on. Think before you. Hang on a minute. Somebody else that I haven't heard from. If you were going to name us, there's no right, wrong answer to this one. There's just what do you think you should call us? Uh, what? A human group? Okay, he said we're part of a human group. Actually, that's absolutely correct. Great answer. Yes, ma'am. What do you think? Yes, ma'am. What would you name us? She's getting help from the side. Like my personal name? Oh, that's awesome. We're going to name you after me. Um, well, what do we all have in common? What's something that we all have in common? Yes, sir. We're all people. Where was that back there? What did you say? He said, I love Jesus. Is that something that we all have in common? Everyone eats 
Well, but we're talking about things that for church, and he is, that's, can I, I don't want to, can you catch, there you go, okay, I did not want to throw it at you, thank you, that was a great answer, he said we all love Jesus, and that's kind of what I wanted us to think about, we are part of a flock, but here's the other piece that's kind of cool, our flock can have anybody that we want in it, so hopefully when you're out and about, and you're at school, can you invite somebody to even come to Sunday school with you? Or be, your, or be your friend? Yes, sir? Somebody who's making fun of someone? Was that kind? Okay, what would you want them to do differently? He said somebody was making fun. You'd want them to be nice? Awesome, awesome. But I have a question. Do you all have a father? Yeah. Everybody does at church. Who is that? God. Yes. So we are part of a great flock. I would say we're like the best, best flock of all. We're Christians, right? And we all believe in God. And what I, what, what I want you to do this week is to see if you can do something or talk to someone and invite them to be a part of your flock. And sometimes you do it by just being nice with somebody who has, again, a similar interest. That's what a flock's all about, something that's the same. Um, can you do that for me? Can we pray? Father, we ask you to bless each of these young people in front of you and make sure that we all remember that we are part of a great flock. We are part of your flock. In Jesus' name, we pray. Amen. And in the meantime... Please help yourself to, I looked for birds, and the only thing I could find were peeps, but here's a, there's where birds come from. They come from an egg. So please help yourself. If you already have one, and there's enough, you can have a second one, because you got one early because you answered a question. But you got to go quick, because Pastor Mike is waiting. <laughs> Sorry. Just take one and go. They're all pretty much the same. That's good. Take off. That's good. Take off. There you go. There you go. Okay. Awesome. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you.
Thank you, choir. That was beautiful. Okay. Um, let's see. Our um, Old Testament lesson comes from the book of Proverbs, which we heard about from Drenna. Um, Proverbs 11, verses 12 and 13. Whoever belittles another lacks sense, but an intelligent person remains silent. A gossip goes about telling secrets, but one who is trustworthy in spirit keeps a confidence. And now our New Testament lesson comes from Matthew chapter 11, verses 16 through 19. This is Jesus speaking. But to what will I compare this generation? It is like children sitting in the marketplaces and calling to one another. We played the flute for you, and you did not dance. We wailed, and you did not mourn. For John came neither eating nor drinking, and they say he has a demon. The Son of Man came eating and drinking, and they say, Look, a glutton and a drunkard, a friend of tax collectors and sinners. Yet wisdom is vindicated by her deeds. Well, let's stand together and sing ancient words. around you and greet them with the love of Christ. Morning. Good. Good. 
Good morning. So uh, the series is called Birds of a Feather, and uh, Drenna's right that the saying is birds of a feather flock together. I'm just curious, how many of you here, this is your home church, you grew up here? A few, a few, which is, is interesting because most of the time we do end up kind of flocking to a church that suits us, that it, it fits our, the flavor of what we love about Christ. There are a thousand different ways to be a Christian, right? And so churches tend to be places where people flock together, and so we have similarities. Um, just in, in terms of, uh, you know, our personal, uh, I don't know, characteristics, I guess, about our Christianity, I want to play a little bit of catch-up. If you recall, this series actually started on Ash Wednesday, and uh, of course, I couldn't take any of my audio-visual vi- aids with me, and last week we had the internet down, so I want to play catch-up. The first week, which was Ash Wednesday, we had the raven, and uh, do we have a picture of that up there, Jamie? And... Uh, the raven has a, a very unique call. Yeah, go ahead. It's not, it's not beautiful. It's ominous, right? I mean, it's kind of like, you hear that and you kind of think, oh, that's, that's kind of ominous. Now, if you were to put a flock of ravens together, does anyone know what it would be called? Close. You're so close with murder. It's a murder of crows. It's a conspiracy of ravens. Not bad, not bad, right? What we had last week was a woodpecker. Look at this. Yeah. That's so cool. Now, if we were to take a flock of them, now typically they just uh, pair up and are together, but if you happen to see a bunch of them together, do you, anyone know what they would be called? A descent. A descent. I don't know why. Well, today, can anyone guess uh, what we're going to turn to today based on the Scripture readings? Oh, well, I, I, that probably could have worked. I, today, we turn our attention to the vulture and what we can learn from the vulture. Now, most of us would probably agree it is, if not the most hideous bird, it is certainly one of the most hideous looking birds. I mean, it's got that bald head, and I mean, could anyone see beauty in a bald head? Oh, gosh, right? Right? Well, in the old world, there are 15 different varieties of vultures, and they are unrelated genetically to the seven New World species of vultures Today, um, and some of them are endangered, that what's happened is some of them have been poisoned. Uh, in, Idi- in India, they, um, they were putting injections into cows, into cattle, and the vultures were eating the dead cattle, and it was killing them. So 99% of the vultures, uh, this one type in India, are, are gone. Um, but the good news for us is that there are plenty of turkey vultures around here. I happened to see one today, about five minutes before I came out there, went one right by the window. I said, oh my goodness, there it is. We have 18 million turkey vultures here in America, and well, maybe globally, but mainly, well, they're mainly right here in the, in the New World. Um, a turkey vulture is almost three feet. It's 32 inches high if it's standing there. Its wingspan can be about 72 inches. That's six feet wide. That's a six-foot wingspan. And uh, they can be up to five pounds in weight. And one it was, was kept in captivity, lived to 48 years old. Now, if you were to see a group of vultures in the air flying, you would call them a kettle. But if they land and are resting on the ground or on trees or maybe on your house, that's called a committee. That's not bad, right? But if you see them feeding, a flock of vultures feeding on a dead carcass, it's called awake. Awake! That actually makes sense. Uh, Awake. So, the vulture is not exactly a songbird. Um, Let's go ahead and play that sound. (laughs) 
The vulture is a, it, it doesn't have vocal cords, and so the most it can get out is, is this kind of nasty sounding hiss. But the vulture is the highest flying bird. Uh, it doesn't use the strength of its wings, uh, it, it uses the thermal energy of, of the different uh, flows of, of, of heat and cold, and, uh, which, and it flies higher than any other bird. 1973, a griffin vulture in Africa collided with an airliner at 37,900 feet. That's almost eight miles high. And so when Bette Midler was singing about the wind beneath her wings and how she could fly higher than an eagle... She probably should have done some research. <laughs> now, technically, the, the vulture is a bird of prey, but mostly they feed on carcasses. They've been known to, uh, to attack and kill small or wounded animals, but mostly they feed on carcasses, and they're patient. They will wait for the predators, predators to kill, and uh, especially if the hide is too thick, They'll wait for the predators to really get in there and have all that they want, and the larger animals will get in, and eventually they'll just wait until they can come down and feed, and they will pick the carcass to the bone. Now, a, a vulture can smell death and decay up to eight miles away. And you know, if something dies, almost immediately it begins to decay. It's, it's I mean, it's a very short period of time before the cells begin to, to disintegrate, and... Uh, but bacteria, and bacteria begins to grow all over the animal, but it's not an issue for the vulture because it has these really strong stomach acids that kill all of the bacteria. They, there's like nothing that can kill it, but they do prefer fresh meat, just like you and me, um, although they'll eat everything up to the place where it becomes putrefied. And um, another interesting fact is it gorges on food and it will store it in its crop. I didn't know what a crop was until this week. It's like this little food pouch in its body that it stores. It'll gorge and then it'll store it in there. And if you threaten it, it will throw it up at you. But not as a self-defense measure. It's more as a, it, it, what it does is it lightens the load so it can get away faster. But a lot of people th think, oh, they're just like throwing up at me. It's interesting, the characteristics of the, uh, the vulture, um, how much it has to do with thermoregulation, maintaining a right temperature, and cleanliness. Do you know why it has a bald head? So it can get in there and really dig into the animal, and, and it will be easier to clean itself off. It also ma maintains temperature that way, but it mainly seems to be about cleanliness. And you, have you ever seen the, the vultures, and they, and they do this thing, you know, and they they're spread their wings out, and they're standing like that? It's kind of creepy looking. They're just drying their wings, cooling themselves down, but also letting the air dry and the sun kill the bacteria that gets on their wings from eating the, the animals. And finally, I, maybe you've never seen this in a vulture. I, I've never been this close. But apparently, as it's walking through, it will just start urinating on itself. For purpose, it cools itself down that way. But it also, because what it urinates is sterile, it kills the bacteria. I know it's a lot of information, but I was fascinated. Vultures are known for picking the corpse to the bone. And that's exactly what we do to each other. You were waiting for it, weren't you? You know, um, it's, it's one thing when you're with your friends and you sit around and you talk about someone over there and you pick at them. You pick them to death, right? And you laugh at it and you put them down. And that's bad. That's, that's actually really bad. But what's, what the Internet has done is created these things called Internet Trolls and cancel culture, right? Like it has given power to people who are knit, who want to say awful things and everyone else reads it then. Instead of just saying it to your three or four closest friends, everyone sees it. And the worse you say, the worse it is, the more people see it. It's awful. I had Jamie show the Super Bowl video. How many of you, the opening video this morning, how many of you recognized it from the Super Bowl? They played it, right? Well, not one, one hand goes up. At the Super Bowl, they played this video. And it's, it's by the He Gets Us campaign. It's a, it's a fairly, it's a, I think it's, I don't even know who it is. It's a conservative group of people who have this campaign of, of commercials that show up on, online and on TV. And they're basically, they're Christian messages about Jesus who gets us. 
Now, if you were watching the video, you could see that these people are washing the feet of other folks. And as you're watching the whose feet are being washed, you can see, oh, these are, these are, tr- these are, um, these are, these are hot button issues. Almost every one of them with some sort of hot button issue. That if you're watching it, you're, you could have been triggered by it, right? Well, I watched it at the Super Bowl, and I remember watching it, thinking, okay, that's cool. I mean, like every preacher for the last 2,000 years has used some version of that as a, as a sermon illustration, that Jesus would wash the feet of the sinner. He dined with sinners and tax collectors, right? So I just thought, I mean, like most of the He Gets His commercials, I watch it, and sometimes I like it, sometimes I'm like, ah, I don't know, sometimes I'll debate with it, but in the end, I'm like, well, they're right, He gets us. Like, I usually end with that in my head, hey, He gets us. I was shocked to find within a day the news articles that were being, the articles that were being written by Christians about this, anyone aware of this? If you don't read Christian articles, you probably weren't aware. The liberal Christians tore it apart. I, I like, it was, it was hard to read the level of anger and hate directed at evangelical Christians and Hobby Lobby and, and that what a waste of money and how dare they. And I, I like, I almost couldn't read the articles. They were so mean-spirited and I'm thinking, we're Christians, right? And it was about Jesus washing the feet and loving people. And sure enough, a day or two later, I saw another article by conservative Christians who also hated it. Then I became interested. Both sides hated it. The conservative Christians said it's heresy. Jesus never condoned sin. And uh, like they, they went on in the same, they should have shown this video. And it was just horrible. I hate to see Christians picking at each other. It's awful when we do it. It's awful when we do it with our friends. It's awful when we read it about other people. You never see atheists putting each other down, questioning their lack of belief. You don't see Muslims putting each other down. You don't see... It's only us Christians who are so good at putting each other down. I think it is born out of a higher ideal to love one another. The sin sin of putting each other down and ripping each other apart is born out of a higher ideal to love one another. The problem is we think we know how to do it best, and so we want to criticize the way others do it. I I didn't know if we'd be singing, they'll know we're Christians by our love today, but... uh, It's a good one, right? They'll know we're Christians by our love and the way we shred each other apart when no one's looking. Stephanie read the passage about from Matthew where where Jesus said, How what do I compare this generation to? We played the flute for you and you wouldn't dance. We mourned and you wouldn't we wailed and you wouldn't mourn. Nothing you did was good enough. You didn't like John, you don't like me. Nothing is good enough for you. You know, it's interesting. You rarely will ever see someone who's doing more than you put you down. Someone who's more successful or maybe better at something, it rarely do they put someone down. Typically, we are putting people down who we maybe th- feel threatened by. Which, remember that next time you're speaking about someone else in a negative light. John Wesley committed himself at some point in his ministry, he said, this is it, this is the last time, I'm never going to say anything negative about anyone again. Think about how liberating that is. Like if you started today and just said, okay, from this moment on, no matter what, what, I, what it is, I will, I will keep my thoughts to myself and I will not out loud say anything negative about anyone again. E. Stanley Jones says your critics are actually your friends. And the more critical they are, the better, because they let you know what you're doing wrong. Because your friends aren't going to tell you what you're doing wrong. Your enemies will. I, was, I had dinner with his daughter. It was like having lunch with, dinner with a celebrity. And she said that she, she was in India. He was a missionary in India, a Methodist missionary in India. And he would go to these, you know, there'd be like a, a room of 100 people. 
and they would just like berate him and tear him. He was just trying to share the gospel, and he was dealing with other faiths, and they were shredding him apart. And she said she just, just sunk down in the chair as, as he would respond, and, he would, and, and, he would, and they would criticize him, and he would start to laugh. Not at them. He would laugh and say, <laughs> you're probably right. What an interesting way to respond to someone when you get criticized. Well, they may have, maybe they have a point. You all are mostly, mostly too polite to tell me what I'm doing wrong, and I like that. I don't, I'm not encouraging you to start. But you, you, I appreciate that you keep it to yourselves or within your, your circles, and you don't actually tell me what I'm doing wrong. I actually do like that. <clears throat> Well, surely there's a more positive message that we can learn from the, the lowly vulture. The vulture is the ugliest bird, or close to it. But it doesn't attack, and it mostly doesn't kill. And while it is repulsive, it actually does a lot of good. A lot of good. It cleans the carcasses, and it limits the spread of nasty bacteria. That's a real thing. In India, where, where they've lost that 99% of that population of vultures, they're like, we have to have plants, like factories, that gather up all the dead, and gr- I don't even know how they get, dispose of them, but it's, they said it's so much easier if we can just rebuild the vulture population and let them do it. It's so much cheaper. This is expensive, and the, and the vulture actually cleans the carcasses and limits the spread of bacteria. You know, the blue jay is pretty, and we tolerate it, even though it's mean. It's pretty, so we put up with it. But blue, bear, blue, a, blue jay is a mean, mean bird. Well, it was a Thursday night, and Jesus had gathered his disciples in a large room in the city for Passover. And the devil had already put it in the heart of Judas Iscariot to betray him. And Jesus knew it. No one else seemed to know it yet, but Jesus knew what Judas had done and was about to do. And it's interesting to me because there's part of me that, you know, if you were in a, a dinner situation with your closest friends and, and there, there was someone like Judas there who was already in the act of betraying you, like there's a part of you that might want to say to Peter and the other fishermen, toss him out of here. Right? There's a part of you that may have wanted to do that. And Peter would have loved to have done that. Oh, there's a bad guy in the group? Peter would have, would have, come on, Andrew, let's get him. They would have loved to have tossed him out into the street. But Jesus knew that God had already arranged things so that as awful as what Judas was about to do and, and the repercussions of what Judas was about to do, that it was all actually going to work out for the better. And so as everyone was settling in for supper, including Judas Iscariot, Jesus got up, he took off his outer robe, he tied a towel around his waist, and he poured water into a basin, and he began to wash the feet of the disciples. And as he would wash them, he would dry them off with a towel. Now, you know, the first century foot is, is different from ours in this way. We wear, we, we wear enclosed shoes, Right? And so we may get that vinegary smell, right? Or the toe jam that gets into the, uh, you know what I'm saying? And, and I know there's an, I'm assuming everyone else has an, o- there's an odor to it. Um, the Koreans have a word for it. You ever see a Korean and you say, go dang ne? Just say that word, they will start laughing. Like it's a way to break the ice with Koreans. I'll say, go dang ne? Is that a word? And they'll say, <laughs> it means the funk under the toenails. That's the word, it's a word for it. Well, that's, that was, that's our feet, and that's, I don't, you know, like a lot of us have done f- foot washings, and you have to deal with that if you're going to do a foot washing. You have to know that you're going to get the vinegar and the golong ne. The first century foot was, uh, it was a flip-flop foot, which we know, we're familiar with that too. Some of us wear flip-flops almost all year round, but you take a shower every night, most of us. But we're walking on sidewalks and pavement and grass, whereas the first century foot is in flip-flops walking on dusty streets and dusty roads. And so, and they're callous. It's a calloused foot. 
And so when you think about the callus and the dirt and the dust, and there is some sweat involved in that, I mean, it just gets caked on. I don't think it's as gross, honestly, as, as the vinegar, but it's harder to clean. You've got to, if you're going to wash a dusty, dirt-caked foot with calluses, because you've got to get in the cracks, right? Like, you've got to, if Jesus is washing these feet, there's, I mean, there's, there's, some, pu- there's some push to it, right? Like, you're getting it wet, and I'm assuming he did a good job, right? Like, this is Jesus. He's dead tomorrow by 3 p.m. This is one of his last acts, and it's with his closest people, including Judas Iscariot, and he's cleaning, and he's cleaning. And even as he's wiping off, imagine the towel. It probably still got dirty. Imagine the water. I mean, there's dust and dirt, and, and he's, it's just getting darker and darker as he goes around, and, and he gets to Peter, and Peter, you know, Peter said, Lord, you're going to wash my feet. Jesus said, you don't know what I'm doing right now, but later you're going to understand. And Peter says, you'll never wash my feet. And we'll see, what happened? You were supposed to wash the feet when you got there. It was a typical, the servants would do it. You'd wash your feet before you got into the living room. A lot of you take your shoes off when you get to the house, right? Kind of the same principle. It was to clean everything off before you got into the, in the living room or the, you know, the dining room. And it didn't happen. And maybe it was arranged that way, but for whatever reason, I, part of me thinks Jesus went ahead and arranged that, right? Like, let me handle the feet. And so he, Peter says, you'll never wash my feet. And he says, unless I wash you, you have no share with me. Unless I wash you, you have no share with me. Well, Peter said, well, do my hands on my head then, too. Well, typical Peter, right? He wants to dive in. If you're going to do a little bit, do it all, Jesus. Jesus just says, well, one who's bathed doesn't need to wash, but is entirely clean. He's saying, you know, there's more to it than just the washing of your feet, Peter. Just calm down. You're going to get it in a few weeks. And then he, he pauses and he says this ominous thing. And you're clean. And you're clean but not all of you. I don't, I don't mean to look at you, Laura, when I say it. <laughs> I should have just looked off into the distance. And you're clean, but not all of you. There's an ominous thing. Like, they're right. Like, what does that even mean? Who's, who's, not, who's not clean? This passage and what it refers to is so close to the story of the lowly vulture. The vultures eat dead things, and their stomach acids are immune to the bacteria. The Mayans actually called vultures death eaters because they could eat death and live. But the vulture is also instinctively aware of the dangers of disease. They take precautions to naturally keep clean. I talked about it. The, the bald head, the, uh, the, the horolytic stance is what it's called, uh, and the urinating. Like These are things that cleanse the bacteria, that that's an intentional kind of natural thing that it does. It naturally deals with the stuff that no one else wants to deal with. They, the vulture deals with and picks clean the things none of us really want to touch. And it prevents the spread of bacteria and disease. My goodness, that's what Jesus does, isn't it? Jesus cleans our dirtiest parts. And he is never grossed out by it. Jesus is willing to do the dirty work. He says to Peter, you'll understand later what I'm doing. He's willing to... There's a, there's a literal... And typically, I'm, this is how I preach this passage. Jesus is willing to be the servant leader. He's willing to get down and do the dirty dirty job. Typically, that's how I preach this sermon. But there is a symbolic level to this that is is so much more profound. He is willing to symbolically cleanse us, to scrub and pick away at the dead that is rotting us inside. Our sin and our, 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 the rotten parts of us Paul says, for our sake, he made, he made him to be sin who knew no sin. Jesus, who, who knew, he didn't, he never sinned. He didn't know sin, not, not, he'd seen it. He was experienced uh, it from others. 
but he knew no sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. That our righteousness, our cleansing comes through Jesus. And on the cross, Jesus took death itself. Jesus took the sin of the world. My sin, your sin, the sins of grandma and the sins of your neighbor and the sins of all the world and picked them clean and just brought them into himself. Now, all that sin that he absorbed killed his physical body. But then he transformed that death into life. Jesus eats our death and picks us clean so that we can live. That's beautiful. You know, just like I said, as soon as, as, soon as something dies, the body, it's almost immediate. The cells, just because there's nothing, there's no life in it anymore. And so it immediately, the bacteria and stuff, this, things start to break down immediately. When we sin, even the little ones, where we just want to sit and talk to our, our friends about someone else, the little ones, where we're just a little bit selfish, just a little bit mean, a little bit spiteful, a little bit gossipy, a little bit selfish, just that little stuff, it's, it's immediate. And it's not obvious at first. It takes time. But if it goes unchecked, that rot starts to spread. I'm not going to get into the phases of rigor mortis. There are like four more mortises until putrefaction. And I promise next week, well, I can't promise. I don't think I'm going to get gross next week. But there's a process that the farther you drift from God, the more it just, it expands and expounds, and, and the rot just can, and if Jesus doesn't check it, if Jesus doesn't come and pick our souls clean, we become putrefied. Our souls become putrefied. That's, a, that's the smell. When you smell death, that's putrefication. And that's what our souls start to smell like when we don't come to Jesus for the forgiveness of our sins. There's a thin line between putrefaction and purification. There's a thin line, and his name is Jesus. Lord Jesus, cleanse us of all our sins. Let us pray. Lord, we come to you today. Some of us have stuff on our hearts, stuff that we've been carrying, and we don't even want to share it with you, even though we know you know. Lord, take these rotten parts of us and pick us clean. Make us clean again. Wash us clean that we might know righteousness, that we might return to God, leave from here set free. All this we ask through Christ. Amen. Thank you, Pastor Mike. That was a really important message. I don't think I would have thought a message about vultures would be beautiful, but it, it really was. <laughs> Good job there. <laughs> um, so now is our time to give back um, a portion of our, offering, our, our offerings. Um, uh, so if the ushers would please come forward. You know, it's funny. Some sermons write themselves. Some series write themselves. This series has been an easier than some of them. So I, I'm enjoying it so far. I hope you are as well. A couple of announcements. We, um, the men's ministry will be meeting this Thursday at 6 p.m. at Mission Barbecue, and they're going to have a barbecue fellowship dinner at Mission Barbecue. So you're welcome to join them. Um, you're going to pay for your own meal, but it's a fellowship meal, and so if you're a man in the church and you're looking to get involved in some men's stuff around here, uh, that's a good place to start. So this Thursday at 6. Um, we have a sock hop coming up, and uh, that's gonna, we're going to begin to start talking more about that as we head through Easter. It'll be after Easter, but not long after Easter. We also have a pulled pork barbecue dinner coming up. Um, some folks have asked, is this to replace the ham and turkey dinner? And well, in some ways it is. We used to have two ham and turkey dinners, one in the fall and one in the spring. But the spring one was just, it was dwindling. You know, it was almost not worth the effort 
um, for what we returned, because it's a fundraiser. And so the new generation, the younger generation of uh, folks here at the church said, wouldn't it be cool if we did a barbecue, a pulled pork barbecue? And so we're going to have the fixins with mac and cheese and baked beans, I think. And uh, it's, it's just going to be, we're going to test it and see how it goes. But that's going to be coming up again. If you're interested, I can talk to you more about it. But uh, really, I would go to Candace Schiffler. She seems to be the, the gal running the men who are going to be cooking the barbecue. And so I'd check in with Candace if, you're, if you want to be a part of helping with that. Um, I've got to say, great work. Last week, I talked about Appalachian Service Project, the ASP trip that's coming up. Uh, I said, you've got to get signed up by March 1st. And you believed me, because it was true. <laughs> A lot of you did sign up. I think we have at least 10 more spots, which means there's still space, but we are running out of time. You've got until the end of this month, which is like three or four, four days away from now. Um, if you're planning to go on ASP, get yourself signed up, because uh, I, I would hate for you to miss out. The more people that go, the better, the more fun it is. And, um, you know, a couple people have asked, you know, I'm, I'm not really good with tools, you know, I just have a heart to serve. That's all we're really looking for is a heart to serve. We've got enough folks who know enough of what they're doing that we can, um, you know, we're, gonna, we're not going to put you out there and make you build a deck without somebody that knows what they're doing, if that makes sense. So get yourself signed up. Uh, I don't care if you don't have a lot of tools. We, there are plenty of tools. Um, it's more about having the hands and more than anything. I mean, we do good for, for folks, but it is there's a fellowship about a birds of a feather type experience where you just, you kind of fall in love with this kind of work and this kind of experience. Uh, I said all that to say, you got a few days left, get yourself signed up, don't forget. Um, also, you've noticed, you probably have noticed we're beginning to use QR codes a little bit more in the bulletin. Sometimes we just have two, the bulletin gets just too big. And so we're going to start using these QR codes. If you're not familiar with what it is, you take your phone your smartphone, you put on the camera and you look at this QR code. There are these squares that have like black dots on them um, and it'll take you to a website. We'll be doing signups that way, but also there'll be maybe like flyers and stuff that you'll be able to access. We're just, we're learning the technology ourselves in the office, but it's an opportunity for us to kind of, it's not just about saving paper, but it, just saving space and making things a little bit more uh, just 21st century-esque. So uh, be, be aware of that, that there'll be more of those coming, including the guests who's coming to dinner. You can see that there's a QR code there now, which will, you, can, um, you can scan that and sign up that way if you're going to join in this, uh, this. It's going to kind of be a sprawling event that lasts for a couple of months. Uh, we do have hard copies in the foyer if you would prefer to do it that way. But um, we've, we have enough folks that our first meal is being planned. We've already assigned the first host with several guests, they don't all know each other. And I know that might be a little bit intimidating, but it's actually going to be really fun and cool. Um, and so that is already being planned. My advice is, if you're willing to host, also sign up and say you're willing to be a guest. You may end up getting two meals out of it. I can't promise that. But, you know, just as we're balancing, we have more hosts than we have guests so far, if that makes sense. So sign up either way, guests or hosts. Don't, don't feel like you're being selfish by saying I'm going to be a guest. And I'm, you know, like, don't do it. There are people who want to be hosts. So uh, it's a great chance to get to know some folks in the church. Birds of a feather flock together. So who knows who you're going to get flocked up with. Um, also, you see that there's an announcement for new members. New membership class will be coming up in a few weeks. It's a two-week period. We did start our confirmation class last week. We've got a nice group of kids already. I'm sure they've done all their homework and uh, can't wait to hear what they have to say today at 2 o'clock. Um, and finally, I think it was last week I talked about the $600 plus dollars that, was, uh, that we raised during the Mardi Gras Pancake Supper for VBS. After church, somebody came up to me and said, I'll, I'll donate another $650. So, right? I mean, you know, that's, yeah, that's just great. That gives us more money to be able to do, do some cool stuff for the kids at Vacation Bible School. And so thank you to that donor. And um, well, I believe that's the end of their announcements. We're going to stack the chairs today afterward and uh, do as we normally do. Let's stand for the doxology.
Let us pray. Dear God, we lift up all those who are in need of your healing and your comfort. We pray for those who are grieving the loss of a loved one and for those who are struggling with concerns that only you and they know. When the troubles of this world are too much, let us focus on you, Lord, and find peace and the strength to do your work here on earth. We ask for your blessing on the activities of Rehoboth Church, Lord, and ask that you continue to show us the path that you would have us take. And now we pray as your son Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. the good news that he has died for our sins to make us clean. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. 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 This is where I want to 